What's going on, everyone? You're tuned in to the Founder Hour podcast. I'm your co-host, Pat, and today's guest on the show is Jeff Fleur. Jeff is a co-founder and former CEO of StubHub, the world's largest online ticket marketplace for sports, concerts, theater, and other live entertainment events. He's also a general partner at Craft Ventures, investing in marketplace and e-commerce companies such as Twilio, Warby Parker, and ZocDoc. Jeff began his career working for the Blackstone Group in New York. While at Stanford Graduate Business School, he entered the annual business plan competition with the idea of creating a trusted and transparent marketplace where fans could buy and sell tickets for sporting events and concerts. He dropped out of school and co-founded StubHub in March 2000. By 2007, StubHub had over 400 employees, more than $600 million of gross merchandise volume, and partnerships with many professional and college sports teams. Jeff served as CEO of StubHub until it was acquired by eBay for $310 million in 2007. Please enjoy our conversation with Jeff Fleur. Yeah, so I grew up, you know, I, I moved around a little bit as a kid. I, I was actually born in, in the suburbs of Chicago, Illinois. And then when I was about six years old, I moved to the suburbs of Boston. Um, and then when I was about 11, I moved to um, Morristown, New Jersey. Um, and so M- Morristown, New Jersey is where I say I grew up because that's where my for- you know formidable years were. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I went to junior high school and high school in, in Morristown and, um, and, and, you know, like my, my buddies that, that I'm still friends with from high school are, you know, Morristown buddies. So, um, so Morristown is, is where I grew up and, um, you know, went to public high school, public, you know, elementary school, but public school my whole life until college. And, uh, so kind of a product of, of public school education. And, um, you know, had a great, had a great experience there. Jeff, what were you like as a kid? Were you into school? Were you just this rebellious kid that wanted to do things his own way? Give us a little bit about your personality. Yeah, I was pretty, um, so, you know, as, as a, as a little kid, you know, so in, you know, kind of grade school, um, I was really interested in magic, um, magic tricks. I was a magician. Uh, so this was kind of in my, you know, sort of call it, you know, six, seven, eight, nine years old. Um, and, uh, and I used to love to go to this, there was a magic shop at the time I was living in Andover, Massachusetts. And there was, there was a little magic shop called Jim's jokes and hobbies. I used to go to and, uh, and buy magic tricks with um, my, you know, my mother used to take me there and I would, I, I, I was, like fascinated with the whole idea of like making other people, um, you know, you know, wonder how you, how you did a trick or, you know, do, doing a, a card trick and, and really, um, making other people, you know, kind of not, not believe it. So that, that was super fun for me. And, um, and I, and I loved it. I had, I had like a, this magic, um, kind of, stand with like a, like a table that I, 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 my mom helped me build and like put like a, almost like a cloth over it. And it said like Jeff the great on it. Um, and so that was my, that was kind of my stage name. name. Magician. It, yeah, exactly. Jeff, Jeff, Jeff the, great. the great. So I used to do like, did you think that that was going to be, did you think that that was going to be like your career when you grew up or at the time, or was it just a fun hobby you enjoyed doing? I think it was more the latter. I don't think I ever, I, I never thought about it as a career. You know, I, I, I don't think I was, um, thinking about, you know, Matt being a, ma- a professional magician, but I, I had a lot of fun with it. I used to love to do card tricks and I used to love to go to the, the magic shop and buy like, you know, different magic tricks and, and, uh, and, 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 and make people, you know, kind of get, guess how, 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 how it was done. But as you know, a magician never tells his secrets. So, um, so I, I would, I would, I would keep those close to pretty close to the vest, but, um, that was kind of me in my, you know, elementary school years. And then, you know, I, and I was, I would say I was pretty, you know, straight and narrow, pretty, um, uh, you know, kind of followed the rules and, yep. and liked, I liked school and, um, I did well in school. And then when I got to high school, so then, then I moved to, you know, Morristown, New Jersey, as I said earlier, and I, and in high school, you know, I think I started to, like a lot of teenagers, you know, started to push the boundaries more and, you know, and, and explore more and maybe, um, you know, I still did really well. Like I, I did really well in high school. Um, but I was 
I was getting in trouble more also, you know, I was kind of, you know, pushing the limits with my parents and, um, I wasn't getting in trouble in school very much, but like with my parents, I was starting to, you know, I think drive them a little bit bananas. Um, and, uh, you know, started the, the kind of the, the social, um, you know, kind of trouble, troublemaking is things like drinking and, and, uh, you know, with friends on the weekends and stuff like that, but, um, nothing crazy. You know, that's probably, no, no, nothing, nothing crazy. No, yeah, no never, arrests you know, or, you know, <laughs> no juvenile hall and <laughs> no, no juvenile hall, um, and no arrests, but, um, but, you know, we're starting to kind of push the limits a little bit and then, you know, and then, um, and I was, oh, the other thing that around, you know, kind of my junior high school years is I started, I started like trying to make extra money. And, um, and there were, there were kind of two things I did kind of, I guess, maybe early signs of entre- entrepreneurship in me were, um, one is I, I found, um, th- there was a product that was, I, I said, I lived in Andover, Massachusetts, you know, kind of six to 11. And I lived in Marston, New Jersey. There was, we, we used to go to, um, we used to go to Red Sox games in Boston when I lived in Andover. And there was like, there was like a a, a toy shop that sold these little toys. Um, when I was, you know, call it 10 years old or something that were called snap azus And it was like this kind of piece of fabric with a bunch of snaps on it. And you would like snap the difference. You could snap different snaps to each other in different ways and make different like animals. And like, you could make like an, like little animal creatures out of like, this little piece of fabric, depending on which snaps you snapped to each other. And, um, and so I thought it was pretty clever. And when I moved to New Jersey, um, I decided to do a deal with the snap manufacturer to kind of become a distributor for, for him in New Jersey. And so I started like, go, like knocking on the doors of like the local kind of toy shops in, um, you know, near where I lived in Marstown, New Jersey and started trying to sell these snap and, you know, and, uh, and, and I negotiated a kind of wholesale rate with the supplier and was selling them at more of a, you know, a markup and, um, and was kind of making money as a, like a distributor of these, of these snap toys. So that, that was one thing I did early on. And then another thing I did is I was, I started selling, um, candy in, 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 in junior high school. And I would, you know, there was like a, like a wholesale candy, like distributor in my town, like a physical brick and mortar store where you could walk into, but you could buy like boxes of candy, you know, on a per item basis, it was like way cheaper than if you, you know, bought individual items at like a grocery store. And, uh, and I used to buy them like in bulk, you know, candy bars and gum and stuff like that and sell it to, you know, kids in junior high school, which was, which was totally against the rules. <laughs> um, and I definitely got my, my wrist slapped at least once for that, but I used to, you know, make extra money doing, doing that in like seventh and eighth grade. So, um, so yeah, those were, those were some of the, the early kind of Jeff stories that I That's, thought, you know, yeah. th- that I thought might give you a little picture of me as a, as a kid. You, you know, it's so funny. Like, um, it's, it's, it's kind of like, it's probably one of the more like common things we've heard of like a lot of the entrepreneurs we've had on the show that have gone on to do like amazing things in so many different industries that a lot of them had sold gum or candy or something when they were a young age. And so it's kind of funny to think back at like, was it like this like cutthroat environment of like a lot of people just like on the block, you know, like this is my turf, like get off of it. Was it like that? Or were you like the sole person at your school? Um, doing yeah, like, like the, the mafioso of like sell, selling candy in, in middle <laughs> school. Um, no, it was, exactly. it was, um, I don't remember anybody else doing it. There might've been other kids doing it, but you know, I don't remember anybody else doing it. And, um, yeah. you know, and it was, it was against the rules. So maybe some people were like scared to break the rules, but, um, you know, I just, yeah. as far as I can re- remember, I was the only one doing it. So it wasn't a lot of competition. Um, so that's a good question though. I- I'm curious, um, you know, when you have kind of like tendencies at that young age of like entrepreneurial stuff and wanting to go out and sell this or do that or do that, like sometimes you've been exposed to like someone in your family or someone around you that is an entrepreneur or like a business owner or something to like kind of ignite that in you. Is Was that the case for you or was it just something that naturally you just decided like I want to do this, it brings me energy, I have fun doing it, whatever? Yeah, so no, that's a great question. So in, in my family, that that was the case. So I... um. I had, a, I had a couple different things, but one one in particular was my grandfather. My my maternal grandfather uh, was um, an entrepreneur, and actually his father was also an entrepreneur. So he came kind of from a lineage of 
you know, kind of New York City, um, you know, entrepreneurs, uh, kind of Jewish, you know, entrepreneurs in the, um, in the kind of garment industry. And so he, he had a store and actually it still exists today. It's crazy. It's been there for like 60 or 70 years. It's a single store in Manhattan. What's it called? Um, it's called Michael's. It's a consignment shop for women, for like high end women's clothing. So he start. so his father was in the fur business, like a furrier, you know, selling like fur coats and things like that. And, and, um, and that was, and so this, that would be, he would be my great grandfather. And then my grandfather, Michael started this shop called Michael's. It's on the Upper East Side. My sister now runs it. My, my grandfather who, you know, passed away a long time ago, um, you know, was running it when I was a little kid. And then my mother took it over when I was like in high school, maybe junior high school or high school. She started working there first and then he passed away and then she kind of took it over and she ran it for decades. And then my sister recently has really taken it over from my mom. So it's just like a, a women's clothing shop on the Upper East Side of New York City. They have a website, you know, michaelsconsignment.com. And, um, and, you know, they sell really high end women's clothing. So, you know, Chanel and, um, Hermes, you know, handbags and clothing, but it's all, it's all like secondhand. It, it's not, some of it actually isn't used, but it's, it's all kind of comes, some, some of it's used owned. and some of it's or pre- previously owned or delicately, you know, gently used, but a lot of it's, you know, very good condition, you know, expensive clothes that you can get for a, a, a discount, um, but not a huge discount. I mean, it's still pretty expensive to buy a Chanel, you know, a Hermes handbag is still a Hermes handbag, even when you're buying it, you know, kind of secondhand. So that's been my, you know, that, so that, yes. Yeah, so that was in my family and I, um, you know, so my grandfather do that and then my mother do that. Um, my father was an engineer and he worked for AT&T for 25 years. So he, he was more kind of the corporate, um, you know, kind of, uh, rising corporate executive. He, beca- you know, became like a, you know, executive at AT&T, but then he took early retirement because they offered a really attractive early retirement package. And then he did an entrepreneurial endeavor, um, in the sort of, um, uh, you know, in the kind of uh, mobile uh, technology space. So, um, so that's, yeah, so that's kind of my, uh, you know, that's kind of my entrepreneurial kind of family story. But yeah, it definitely had an impact on me, for sure. Jeff, I'm curious, you know, you talk about your grandfather and mother and father and great-grandfather. Was there any advice when it came to business that your grandfather gave you uh, back then that you remember? I know you said that he's passed years ago now, but uh would love to know if there's any advice that he shared with you or any uh, good learning lessons or stories along the way of uh, his ventures. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, I, I mean, I, I would say that the number one thing I learned from, from my grandfather, um, you know, and my mom and watching them sort of in, in their kind of, um, in their business was always just like focus on the customer, 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 like focus on the customer. What does the customer want? How can you serve the customer? And, um, you know, and, and that's ultimately the path to success. Um, and so, you know, beyond that, I think it was, you know, there were other things that were, you know, clearly important that I learned from them, like working hard and, you know, having a good work ethic. Um, but I think the number one thing was, it was really just like focus on the customer and, and, and make sure you're delivering a, a strong value prop to the customer. Right. Did you ever think that you would take over Michael's at that time? Or, I mean, were you, after high school, were you just focused on other things? And, and what were those things that you were focused on? I worked at Michael's for a little while, like, you know, on Saturdays, I used to like, remember we, we lived in Morristown, New Jersey. Michael's was on the Upper East Side. So my mom, when she worked there, she like commuted an hour to work every day and back, you know, it's a pretty, it's, it's not that close. And so like for me to, like, it was never feasible for me to, you know, in high school to kind of work there in any kind of full time capacity. But I used to go in on Saturdays occasionally and like help her like do some accounting and bookkeeping and stuff like that. Um, you know, I've been interested. I, I've, I have been somewhat interested in like the, the, what, what's interesting about StubHub, which I know we haven't really gotten to yet, but StubHub is like the resale of live event tickets, right? So it is a secondary market. It's a, it's, it's like a secondhand market in a way. So it, it's not women's clothing, it's tickets, but the one commonality that they have is they all, they are about this sort of resale concept. And so that is, you know, it's not like I, you know, uh, premeditated, Hey, I need to do something in, in the secondhand space and then kind of landed on tickets. It just so happened that I, you know, kind of got interested in the, in the 
take a resale business and and it was like like Michael's it was a resale concept so that is a commonality but but I was never super excited about women's clothing um I mean, I, th- I think maybe maybe the thing that was somewhat interesting is that there would, you know, oftentimes be like attractive women around. <laughs> but other than that, like it wasn't really like a vertical that was uh, super compelling to me. So it was it, it, it isn't something that I've um, gotten super close to like doing, taking over. And my sister, it made more sense for her. And she got involved, you know, mm-hmm. 15 years ago in the store and then kind of took it over mm-hmm. in the last couple of years. So, um, yeah. yeah. And so just to get a better sort of mindset, uh, sorry, an idea of your mindset at the time. So like you have, you clearly have this entrepreneurial bug, you're doing kind of these different things and, uh, kind of in that, in that realm. But I, I think I saw that you had gone to, uh, studied engineering and economics kind of double major. Um, why, why did you, what were you kind of thinking about at that time? And why did you decide, all right, um, I need to get an, a degree in engineering. Um, yeah. what did you have a particular plan in place or was it just something that you thought it'd be something good to get a degree. Yeah, no. So, so the, the, the one thing I didn't mention, I, sh- I should have mentioned as like a kid, you know, pro- pro- so my, I think I mentioned my father was an engineer. He worked for AT&T for 25 years. He brought home mm-hmm. from AT&T, they, they had brought a company called NCR national cash register. It's still around. I don't know if it, I don't think it's still part of AT&T. I think they might've sold it. I'm not sure what the ownership structure is of NCR, but I think at one point they owned NCR, they, they acquired it. And, and that, that, and, and this was like in the probably the eighties. Cause I graduated Let's see. Yeah, it was probably, yeah, it was definitely in the eighties. And, um, and he brought home, uh, an early like IBM compatible PC computer that was made by NCR. Um, and I started like, and we also had, so I had that, but we also had an Apple two E, which was like a very early version of, of an Apple computer. Um, so I had a couple computers, like at the age of like, you know, call it 10 to 15 years old, where I was starting to like play with computers, um, and learning how to program kind of basic and logo and some of these kind of fairly early, um, programming languages. And then I also, he brought home a modem. He brought home a modem, um, that was made by AT&T, an early modem, which, which, which allowed you to do something that you know, was a predecessor basically to the internet where you could, you could call up these things called BBSs, which were bulletin boards. Um, and it wasn't a gra- it wasn't in a web browser. It wasn't a graphical interface like a web browser is today, but you would have like a command line prompt and you would dial a number and your modem would turn on. It would make these terrible sounds like, Whoosh! you know, it would like, do all these things. Yeah. And then like it would connect and then you would start to see text on your screen, right? Like text coming up and you'd be like connected to this like external thing um which was a bbs or a bulletin board and there were these these people were called sysops or sysops system operators that would like that would host these bulletin boards and let other people which which were basically just computers that you could call and they would you could then you know you could then like look at all the files they had and you could like download their files and you you could like up you could let them down you know upload files from your machine and so um so I, I, I used to like download like really rudimentary like video games in like the eighties, you know, from these BBSs. So I was interested in computers and technology and it was again, not something that they offered in my school. So I wasn't taking it in school. It was just something I was like learning on the side after school. And, um, and that interest is something that, and, and I was always, I was very good at math and science. I was never very good at like writing or English or reading. It was always very challenging for me to like read lots of books. I, I remember in like fourth grade, there was like, there was like a, ch- a chart where you could keep track of how many books you read. And there was like this one girl in the class that was reading like two books a week. And I read like two books for the entire year. Um, but anyway, so no gold stars um, for Jeff. That's for sure. <laughs> not in the area of reading. Yeah. That's for sure. Um, anyway, so, you know, so I was good at math and science. I liked computers. And so I, I, I thought that, um, you know, engineering would be like a, a great discipline for me, um, in college. And one of the things I really liked about Penn and ultimately the reason I decided to go to Penn is because they had this, this program called management and technology. And that's what you were just referring to, which is this, this, this program where you can do both finance, which is part of the Wharton school or, or any business they have, you know, finance and accounting and management, but I ended up doing finance, which was part of Wharton. And then you could also do um, a, a discipline in the engineering school. And I did system, what's called systems engineering, 
um, in the engineering school. And there weren't a lot of like undergraduate, you know, schools where you could like double major in kind of engineering and business. And I, and so it was in, in a way, I don't want to say unique because there might've been a couple others, but it was one of the very few that offered it. And, um, and so I, I was pretty attracted to the ability to do that and, um, and went to Penn and did, and did that. Did you know what you would be doing after? I mean, I, I know I had read recently that you got, or you worked at Blackstone and then another company in San Francisco, Thomas Weasel Partners, I believe it was. Um, were, was Blackstone a dream job for you? I mean, was I mean for a lot of people even now, I mean, Blackstone is still a massive company and they are obviously huge in the real estate and finance world and just the investing world in general. Um, was that the path you wanted to go down immediately or it just kind of fell upon your lap and you're like, oh, I guess I'll just do this for now and see where it goes. Yeah. So, you know, as I was, so, you know, in college, I was doing some internships over the summers and I, and all of my, you know, even though I had um, engineering as one of my two disciplines, I was really leaning towards the fi- the finance side as like my first job. I kind of, so I, I did like internships that were kind of building up to this, um, you know, ultimate job in finance after college. And, um, and it basically was a dream job actually. So to answer your question, like get, getting a job at Blackstone right out of, right, right out of Penn, you know, out of undergrad was, um, you know, for me at least it was like kind of the Holy grail job. You know, it, it, it was a, it was a very small firm back then, but it was already a very like kind of coveted. It, it was, it was early in Blackstone, yeah. you know, kind of, you know, growth and ascent. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's, as you pointed out, it's a monster now in, in a good way, right? It's a big, machine of like investing private equity investing real estate investing all these different asset classes they've gotten into and it's you know massive dollars of of like assets under management so so it's a it's been a very successful firm but and i was there and you know i started in 1996 when i graduated from college so um you know and it was it had been around for you know i don't know five or ten years but it was still it was like 80 people at the whole firm and um and so, you know, it was, it was pretty early and it was, it was a great experience, but, but to your question, but to answer your question, yeah, it was kind of like the, it was kind of the dream job. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, I got an offer and, and went to go work there and it was, um, you know, two, two or two and a half years at Blackstone it was a great sort of learning uh, opportunity for me. And, and, um, and I learned a ton in, you know, the, you know, two years and change I was there. Yeah. And then I think I saw that you ended up going to Stanford GSB, uh, for your MBA. And then right around that time was when I think you started StubHub, if I have my timeline correct. So tell us like in that era, kind of what happened, you know, like you're, you're in business school, did the idea come to you in business school? Um, or was it something that came to you after you graduated? Uh, or did you graduate? Like how, what, what happened there? Yeah, I think the backdrop is really important here. If you, if you think about, you know, I was at Blackstone from 96 to 98 and, um, and as I, as I described earlier, I always had this interest in technology and in, in sort of, uh, you know, software programming and was in fact, you know, playing around and experimenting with that in, you know, junior high school and high school quite a bit. Um, but then I kind of, you know, sort of veered away from that, right? Later in high school, I got more interested in girls and going out, you know, with friends and was not really doing much programming. And then I was in college when I was doing a little bit in school, but I was kind of more angled toward this, toward the, toward the finance side. But the backdrop of this time period when I was in college and really when I was at Blackstone was internet 1.0, right? This was the mid to late nineties. This was 96, 97, 98. This was the rise right. to the, to the, um, this was the crescendo to what ultimately became the dot com bubble bursting in March of 2000. But, you know, in the late nineties, you know, Amazon, Yahoo, eBay, Netscape, um, AOL. AOL, all these companies were kind of like coming of age and going public. And then, you know, you had like this next wave of companies that were being funded by venture capitalists. And, you know, then they were going public and some of these companies, you know, pets.com, whatever it was before the bu- bubble burst, these companies were being valued at huge, you know, valuations in the public markets when they would finally hit the public markets, the whole kind of, um, you know, thought process at the time was, it was all about eyeballs, right? It was all like, it was all, how many eyeballs could you aggregate? And like, it didn't matter how much revenue you had or how much, or if you had a business model figured out, but if you had a lot of eyeballs, like then you were worth a lot of money. 
And so that was sort of the backdrop while I was working at Blackstone. And as, as great as it was at Blackstone, it was not that, right? It was not technology companies. It was not internet companies. We were not investing in any of those companies. We were investing in like, and a couple of deals I worked on, we did like, we bought like the two largest wallpaper manufacturers and put them together and made an even bigger <laughs> wallpaper manufacturer. Like we invested in a company called American Axle, which was a, a, a tier one supplier to the auto industry, like making axles and other sort of like heavy steel components for cars and, you know, stuff that was like great buyouts because they were producing cash flow. They might have been growing at, I don't know, 10 or 20% a year, but they weren't like, they weren't this like huge, exciting kind of technology, internet 1.0 that was happening, you know, in another place, mostly in California. Mm -hmm. And so as this was happening, I started saying on myself, like, gosh, that looks really fun and exciting. Yes, I'm learning a lot of Blackstone, but I would like to kind of figure out how to get into that. And yeah, so I ended up going to Stanford Business School. Um, and I, and it was a, you know, it was an opportunity for me to kind of like pivot, right? Cause I could like, you know, take what I, I had an undergraduate business degree from Penn. So in some ways it was a little bit repetitive, but it was more for me yeah. an opportunity to, um, really, you know, pivot my career and, and go in a different direction. And so what, that's exactly what I did. So I went to, I went to Stanford and, you know, in the middle of my first year, even, you know, like, I think it was like January of my first year is when we really wrote the business plan for StubHub. And um, we submitted the business plan for the annual business plan competition. Um, and we were actually accepted as one of the six finalists. We were chosen as one of the six finalists. I think there were like 50 some odd submissions or something. We were one of the six finalists with the StubHub. You know, it was really just an executive summary. It was like a two page executive summary of what we wanted to build. It wasn't even called Stub. We weren't, the name StubHub wasn't yet in existence, but it was the idea for StubHub. And um, and when you say we, Jeff, is this you and who became your co-founder after? Yeah. Yeah. Me and me and the co-founder, um, you know, who, you know, who I, um, you know, who I started StubHub with. And, and he was also, my, he was, you know, my class at Stanford. So we were both in the, you know, first years at Stanford Business School at the time. And, um, and it started in a class that you had together or it started out of, out of, no, class, it wasn't, like it wasn't part a of a class, program. but Stanford business school has an annual business plan competition where you can write like a two page executive summary. You can yeah. submit it. If it's chosen as one of the six finalists and you get to go present to a panel of judges, like pitch, you know, a panel of judges, really, I think all the judges are venture capitalists, which is of course is, you know, roll the clock forward 25 years. And that's what I'm doing now. But, um, yeah. you know, that's, that's who you got to pitch to. And then, one one finalist would be you know chosen as the winner and that winner would get like i think it was like a twenty five thousand dollar you know kind of non-recourse grant basically to go start your company it was like not even it was an equity it wasn't even debt it was just like here here's 25 grand go you know start your company kind of thing yeah. um and um but what what i'm curious what prompted you to decide on what you wanted to enter that and you know like join forces with your co-founder and come up with StubHub? Like what was the initial? Yeah. I mean, we were, so, thing. you know, we were sitting at lunch one day, um, you know, my co-founder Eric had, uh, you know, had, had a father who was a season ticket holder for the Los Angeles Lakers. My father was a season actually was up until a few years ago, a season ticket holder for the New York Yankees. And so we both had like experience with like, okay, you got like you know, baseball, you get 81 games in your season ticket package. It's like, no one actually goes to 81 games and there's always like tickets to be resold and there's ticket brokers. So we both had experience kind of in this space um, and felt like there was a lot of opportunity to build something on the internet, which was very new. And, and the irony of the timing here, I was describing this kind of crescendo leading up to April of 2000. I started business school in September of 1999 um, so the time when we wrote the, the business plan for StubHub was like January, February of 2000. We didn't know that two months later, the entire bottom of the floor was going to drop out below us. Right. But, but, but like the, the world was very exciting when it came, you know, the, the internet.com world was very exciting. And a lot of people were dropping out in the year before us to start companies, you know, and, yeah. but then that all changed. But was it something? Yeah. Yeah. But what was this something that was like something on your mind for a while that was kind of like your, it was like burning inside that you like, I have to go build this or was it like, did it take a while to come across this idea? Like when you decided, you know, I want to, you know, I want to be a part of this, like submit to this competition. No, Eric, like, Eric brought you... it up at a lunch that we had. And I, and I was like, that's, you know, that's a, that's, you know, that makes a ton of sense. My dad, you know, my dad's a season ticket holder. And so we, we, we kind of like built on it and, um, and to like, let's, yeah. you know, and then, 
you know, and then I wrote the, I think I, I wrote the two page executive summary and, um, you know, and, and I, and I said, let's, we, we, there was a, I think there was a trip to Las Vegas in there. Like there was a group of guys that were friends. We all went, we went to Las Vegas. Always a trip to Las yeah, Vegas. There was, there, was, <laughs> there was, you know, a bunch of business school friends went to Las Vegas for a weekend and we were talking about it and that. And then we ended up like writing this business plan or this executive summary. And, um, and you know, yeah, we, 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 we ended up incorporating in March of 2000, we incorporated StubHub like March I don't know, 17th or something on 2000. And then that was like one month before like the entire like apocalypse started with, you know, what, what ended up being a two to three year run of like basically a, um, you know, a desert, mm -hmm. you know, for internet startups, because it was really hard to raise capital at that time because nobody, you know, once the, once the bottom fell out and the stocks crashed, no investor wanted to invest in, you know, kind of a consumer internet play. So that was an interesting time for us um, in those first couple of years to raise capital and, you know, hire people because we were kind of going completely, even though it was the thing to do six months earlier, it was the thing not to do at that time. Right. You know, it became, it quickly became out of favor. Why, why'd you change the name from needaticket.com to StubHub? I mean, needaticket.com is a cool ass name. <laughs> um, are you serious when you say that? Or are you kidding? I'm, I'm dead serious. No, stop. It's a cool no, name. I'm not but saying StubHub is not cool. I'm just saying needaticket.com <laughs> is a cool name. Yeah. I mean, it's a pretty generic name, you know, whereas StubHub, I think, has a lot more kind of, it, it, it's more unique. It's more memorable. Um, but the reality of the name is actually a longer story because the name wasn't StubHub initially. If, so meaning it was need a ticket on that business plan. Then we incorporated, I think the first name we incorporated with was like technically Adrenaline, but we knew that was a placeholder. So it was just like Adrenaline Inc. or something like that. Then the first real name of the company, which was the name of the company for for actually several years, was Liquid Seeds. Um, so there's a lot of names and there's a lot of like, you know, stories behind these names. But Liquid Seats was the, was the corporate name that we decided to go with. And even though the name of the company was Liquid Seats, we actually did have a website called StubHub even from the beginning. So we had a website called StubHub. We had a corporate name called Liquid Seats from the beginning. And the thinking, which in retrospect, I don't, I think was a mistake. Um, but the thinking at the time goes back to sort of, uh, this idea of the internet bubble bursting, which was when April of 2000 happened and the internet bubble burst, the theory, the, 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 the general consensus and the kind of conventional wisdom at the time was B2C was like really never going to happen. Like B2C internet was fun while it lasted, but it's over. There's never going to be a successful B2C internet company because those business models are impossible to make profitable. It's too costly to acquire customers and there can, there, there can be no successful B2C company. And this B2B thing like was maybe going to work, but even that was pretty bad because like all internet was bad, but like B2B like maybe was going to work, but B2C was not going to work. So we were kind of a product of that thinking in a way. And we said to ourselves like, okay, let's, Let's be a B2B company focused on this ticket resale market. And instead of trying to build a brand, we're going to co-partner with media companies and sports teams to kind of build this ticket trading capability into their websites. And we'll power the software. We'll do all the customer support. We'll right. handle all the payments between the buyers and the sellers. But it'll be like white labeled or, or in some cases like co-branded. But um it'll be their brand and their traffic. So we don't have to spend money on customers or eyeballs as they called it. We could just, you know, we could just share revenue with these partners and they could spend all the money on the eyeball. Mm. That was the strategy. And so this liquid seats name was sort of part of kind of that strategy, right? It was like, okay, we're going to have this StubHub consumer site. It's going to be an afterthought. We're not really going to put money into it or spend money on it. It's more going to be an opportunity for us to showcase what our tech can do. Um, but really we're, we're going to, the company name is going to be liquid seats and we're going to try to be more of a B2B kind of uh, play. So this idea was obviously good because you ended up dropping out of Stanford business school after your first year. What gave you the conviction that this was going to work? I mean, were you guys already seeing some sort of traction or you just said, you know, my bridge round of life is over with this business school thing. Time to get back and dive back into the working world. 
Yeah, no. So to the first part of your question, we had no evidence that it was working because we hadn't even launched the site yet. I dropped out of Stanford. I made the decision ultimately to drop out of Stanford that summer because I did, I did finish my, even though, so I was doing both in the second half of my first year, I was both running the beginning of StubHub, raising capital, hiring our first employees. And I was a, a first year student at Stanford Business School. But I did, and I hadn't yet decided, was I going to go back to my second year and try to parallel process these things or not? That summer, summer of 2000, after the dot com bubble burst, um, but before we launched anything, I decided not to go back and, and get StubHub launched. And it was, it was again, very counter to, um, it was, you know, it was, it was running really against the grain because, Again, like, you know, everybody was like, oh, that made sense a year ago, but why, why are you doing that now? We, we, we all know now that the internet's not going to work. Like the, this internet thing was fun while it lasted, but it's not going to work. Why are you dropping out of business school? A lot of people said that to me. My mother said that to me. Um, and I just felt like there was a really big opportunity here, um, to, you know, to, to kind of create a, a much safer and, and more transparent marketplace and more efficient marketplace. Um, for event tickets and was kind of, I had enough conviction that I was willing to like drop out of school, which is what I did. Um, and, um, and we didn't launch a very first version of what was like the StubHub website because that was the first thing we launched was the StubHub website because we didn't have any partnerships yet. Um, and that was like October of 2000 after, you know, the second year of business school was already in session. Right. You know, it's interesting because StubHub has that. I guess let's call it, or early StubHub uh, because it's a marketplace has the challenge of the chicken or the egg, right? Do you go after the customers first? Do you go after the ticket holders first? You know, how, you know, where does like explain to me? Cause I know a lot of people that either listen to this podcast or, you know, our other founders themselves have had this problem before as well, or this challenge, let's call it, I don't want to call it a problem, but how did you approach that challenge? What was your thinking? And then ultimately what did you do? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I can tell you all about our thoughts. And for any founders that are listening that are building, you know, great marketplaces or, or, or early on in the process of building great marketplaces, you know, I'm a, I'm a venture investor now, so we'd love to talk to you and always, always willing to kind of share thoughts, um, you know, with, with founders. I think the, um, the short answer is we did a few things to, um, really sort of isolate the problem down to the smallest possible problem so that we could solve that problem and then kind of go from there. And, and here's what we did. The first thing we did was we said, okay, we're just going to focus on the Bay Area. We're not going to try to build a marketplace for tickets everywhere. We're just going to bring this down to the Bay Area. We were in, you know, we were at Stanford Business School. And so, and then we were in like San Carlos and then we were in San Francisco. We had a couple offices in that first mm-hmm. year that we were kind of moving around, but we, we were in the Bay Area. So we said, let's focus on the Bay Area. That was number one. Number two was, we said, listen, let's let partner with um, some suppliers of tickets so we can get, you know, a small number of people can bring a large supply of tickets into the marketplace. So then we can kind of isolate our problem to really get buyers. Because once we have the supply, we can we can actually go out and um, and focus on acquiring the demand side. Mm-hmm. Um, one idea we had early on that we ended up not doing, I think thankfully not doing was actually seeding the marketplace ourselves. In other words, buying tickets and putting them right. on the marketplace. Right. Um, we didn't do that to any significant degree. I mean, there might've been a small amount of that at, at one point, but um, we, we decided not to do that to any significant degree, which I think ended up being the right decision. But we were able to find, you know, some local ticket brokers in the Bay area. And, and, um, and actually we, we weren't looking for the biggest ticket brokers because the way that at the time and to some extent today, although it has changed quite a bit, um, the way that the ticket brokerage kind of industry works is that there's these like small, relatively small mom and pop businesses. They tend to be regionally focused. So like in any given city, New York city or the Bay area or LA, there'll be call it five to 10 ticket brokers, you know, three or four of them might be pretty significant businesses, 10 to $50 million a year kind of top line businesses. Um, and then a, 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 a larger number, maybe, you know, 10 to 20, 10 to 25 sort of smaller brokers. There's, there's fewer today because there's been more kind of con- consolidation and, and there's more marketplace, you know, dynamics with StubHub right. and others. So it's changed. But back then, that's kind of what it looked like. So we didn't want to go out and partner with the biggest brokers because we knew that they were going to kind of 
like look at us and be like, why should I partner with you? Right. I'm selling $20 million of tickets. You haven't even launched anything yet. But we went to some of those kind of like second tier and third tier brokers who were smaller and maybe even it was kind of a side hustle for them yeah. or they were, you know, a full time, you know, kind of waiter, but they were selling tickets on the side. And we were able to kind of find some of those people, um, you know, using some growth hacking techniques and um, things like going on to, you know, to, to th there were there were some tickets that were starting to appear on Craigslist and eBay. So you could go onto those marketplaces and talk to some of the people who were selling those tickets and say like, hey, you should go check out this other this other, you know, you could you could act as if you were a buyer and then talk to them and then go on and sort of, you know, promote the StubHub site to them. So we were able to kind of build partnerships with a few um, local ticket brokers that gave us pretty good coverage. Like, what, you know, we only needed like three to five of those guys to then get tickets for basically all major events in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. um, and then we could really isolate after we checked that box. Okay, now it's like, how do we get buyers to come and buy tickets? And and that was really where, you know, we kind of mostly employed this partnership strategy, this B2B strategy, where we wanted to then at that point sign up partnerships with local uh, websites basically in the Bay Area. So what were the newspaper and radio station websites were the most logical. Again, this landscape has changed quite a bit since then. But back at the, back in the early 2000s, you had these like newspaper websites, which for whatever reason, they had different names than the newspaper themselves. So it wasn't like the San Francisco Chronicle.com. It was like they had names like BayArea.com, mm -hmm. but it was actually really the San Francisco Chronicles website. And instead of just being a website where you read the newspaper, it was actually like they were doing like different things online than they were doing in their newspaper today. Like the New York times website is just like the New York times right. just where you read the articles. But back then, like these websites were like, um, they were like, they were trying to like consolidate local services and doing things that looked a little bit different than just an online newspaper. And so we were trying to partner with those newspaper websites and the radio station websites so that you could then buy tickets in these kind of co-branded environments um, powered by our software and our customer support and our fulfillment logistics. At the time, it was still all physically mailing tickets from point A to point B. It wasn't yet mm -hmm. printed home. The, the next thing was the printed home tickets and then came the mobile tickets. But back then, it was still like a card stock ticket. So we were dealing with like FedExing of all the tickets. So all of that was like our kind of infrastructure and, and systems. The next thing is going to be um, fingerprints. I mean, like, you know, you just buy it, you yeah. fingerprint it, you go, put your fingerprint and boom, you're in. Or ret yeah, retinal scanner. We got go. that today. <laughs> you know, the, the, the clear, the clear line at the airport's all based yep. on your retinal yep. scanner, right? Yep. I mean, it's just, uh, in some point, that may be how it works. Got to create a new company. It sounds like, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I think I, I saw that it was like a few years into the business where um, your your co founder Eric left the company. Mm -hmm. What what ended up happening? Was it something that happened between you guys, or like, just did he just want to do other things? Like, was there situation there yeah i mean i think um well I, 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 just a couple quick things on that so the, the first thing is like he went and finished his second year at stanford business school so i dropped out was the ceo of the company and well he wasn't even he, he was a co-founder but he wasn't even sure if he wanted to join full-time he, he ultimately i convinced him and tw kind of twisted his arm eventually convinced him to join after he graduated his second year which was sort of a, a year and a half after we started the company as a full-time employee and so he was a full-time employee of the company for a while. I call it, you know, I don't know, a few years, call it three years, maybe. Um, and then ultimately, you know, we had some differences about like which direction to steer the company. And, uh, and then it just made sense for him to kind of go, you know, go on and do his, um, his own thing. Um, and so he left, you know, a few years later and, um, and then, you know, and, and we, um, you know, we ultimately, a few years after that, sold the company to uh, to eBay. Um, but you know, there's obviously a lot in there. In that, it was seven years from when I started the company to when I sold it to eBay. Um, so yeah, and I'm curious from your perspective, like as the person who started it and as a CEO. I think you were CEO at the time, right? When it mm -hmm. sold. Yep. Um, did you do you feel like you sold it at the right time? Like, do you have any any regrets about about it? Like, did you think that it had you? continued it would have uh, been an even bigger valuation at some point or did, did did it feel like it was the right thing to do at the time and and do you still feel that way i think at the time it felt like it was the right thing to do because otherwise i wouldn't have done it right so it's hard to it's hard to say yeah. that at the time it, it, you know it, you know and, and the other things that were going on in my life at the time i got married during the stub of experience i'm still married to the same woman um and 
we had our first kid. She was pregnant with my now 14 year old son, um, who was due, um, two weeks after the day the deal, who, who was born two weeks after the day the deal was closed with eBay. So my wife was like pregnant when we were like negotiating with eBay and I knew my son was coming and I had been working really hard for seven years on StubHub and kind of, you know, burning the midnight oil and sort of, you know, in, in, the, in the classic fashion of your, you know, 25 year old entrepreneur mm-hmm. kind of in a, t- in a team of people in their twenties, just kind of sleeping in the office kind of thing. Um, you know, and then I got married and then we were about to have our baby. And I was sort of like, well, th- you know, and, and eBay came on pretty hard in terms of wanting to buy the company. So I was sort of like, this might be the right time for me to like, you know, move on in my life and kind of, I can always start another company. This isn't, this doesn't have to be the last time, the you know, last one. And I kind of convinced myself it was the right thing to do and, and ultimately did sell it. Um, and at the time that we sold it in 2007, the, the valuation we sold it for was like, it wasn't necess- I don't know if it was the biggest deal that year, but it was one of the larger, you know, kind of internet deals that year. Um, and you know, today the, the, you know, it was 310 million today. That number feels like it's a penny. Yeah. That's um, like a seed round. You know, people are rate people are, that's a series B round. Um, is that what you just said? <laughs> I said a seed, um, but, yeah. but you know, I was making a joke. You yeah, were being exactly. serious. So but we'll set on it, series A. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, you know, so it's, so it's, it's, you know, and, and, and StubHub, eBay recently sold StubHub for 4 billion. So it's, it's be, it, you know, it, it is worth a lot more today than it was when I sold it. And it was still growing pretty fast. So I think in retrospect, I sold it early. There's not, yeah. you know, there's no doubt about that. But, um, you know, I think it's just one of those things where, you know, you kind of live and learn and, uh, you know, it was, it was a great experience and I'm glad, I'm glad the company you also never. Yeah, you also never know like what could have happened had you not sold. Like it's right. It's something that's yeah big on that's true too. And and actually, just on that point, you know, we we sold the company in in uh, February of two thousand seven, and if you remember, two thousand eight was like the Great Recession, right? So it was like a year later, or maybe a year and a half later, or something, when the Great Recession really was in full force, and the um the the, the markets tanked and like you know so we would have had a couple of pretty tough years there just like everybody else did in 2008 2009 but you know but i think we would have gotten through it because the company was already generating you know generating cash and so i don't think we would have failed but it would you know it would have, i'm sure business would have been you know down um or maybe not down but the growth rate would have been down um so anyway it is you know it, it it's um it's definitely a learning, you know, for me is like when, when I deal with entrepreneurs today, one of the things that we sometimes, you know, worry a little bit about is entrepreneurs selling too early, right? Like, and so I've got some, you know, experience in that personal experience in that, that I can kind of bring, you know, bring to the table when I'm talking about entrepreneurs, um, you know, about that issue. Jeff, before we dive into, you know, what you're doing now, so your investing career, I guess the one comment slash question I have is that. You know, Pat and I have been doing this now for four years and interviewing folks and founders and entrepreneurs and investors, et cetera. Um, and there's no doubt in our minds, at least, and I'm sure those that are listening, that being a founder is not easy, right? Starting something up, being responsible for a company, being responsible for people and their livelihoods, et cetera. It's a difficult job. I mean, like, it's, I mean, it's very, very challenging. People don't necessarily see it. They hear the success stories. And it's also a series of difficult decisions, right? Whether it's addressing, you know, with a co-founder or another leader, hey, we're not on the same page. We're not sharing the same vision. Maybe we need to part ways. Whether it's selling the company, whether it's buying a company, right? There's just tough decisions. Is that something that you've learned throughout the years? Is it something that you think was more innate for you to be decisive and to just make a decision and move forward? Well, first let me say, like, I think you're, I mean, I think you're, I think you nailed it. I mean, obviously you've been talking to a lot of entrepreneurs for years. So you, you kind of are, are, you know, seeing it, um, you know, firsthand, but yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it is grueling. It's, it is a very hard job. It gets, you know, romanticized in, you know, movies like, you know, the social network or whatever, but it's, um, you know, it's really hard. It's, um, it's lonely and it's, and it's, and, and most of the time it, it, most of the time it fails, right? Like most of the time it like is actually not successful. And then of course that's really hard, but then even when it's successful, even when it works out well, there's ups, there's downs, it's a roller coaster ride. It's a huge sacrifice. If you have a, you know, a partner, um, it's a huge sacrifice on your relationships. So, 
yeah, it's, it's definitely hard. Um, and I have, and, and that's one of the reasons why I have so much respect for entrepreneurs because yeah, I just, I know firsthand how hard it is. Um, I think in terms of like the, the question about being decisive and, and, you know, for me, was it, you know, was it innate? I mean, I think, I do think it's important to be decisive. I, I often wish I was more decisive, you know, that I, that I think sometimes I've, I, I like, as when I when I was a CEO, I would like to get I I wanted to get other people's opinions when there was a big question, right? I wanted to kind of it's not, it's not that I was looking for consensus, but I wanted the information. I was collecting data so that I could then make a decision um, with you know different opinions at the table. So you know, and sometimes that felt like I wasn't being decisive because I was you know deliberating or trying to get you know more data. But I think. Um, I think it is important to be decisive. I think, you know, you can't, you can't please everybody all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you probably can't please all everybody. Most of the, you know, most of the time, most of the time you're probably going to have to please some people and, and, and displease others. And so I think, you know, it's part of it's that learning and also um, making tough decisions around, you know, people, right. Sometimes people, you know, aren't the right fit for a company and they need to be, you know, you, you need to kind of move, move on and, from a person and sort of um, part ways and find someone else for a role. Um, and, um, you know, and I think, but, but yeah, there's like a lot, lots of tough decisions. We had, you know, we had a lot of challenges around this question of B2B versus B2C that I described earlier, you know, because later we didn't talk about this yet, but Later in StubHub, probably around 2003 or four, we got rid of the Liquid Seeds name. We changed the name of the company to StubHub, and we got rid of the whole B two B strategy. And everything was about B two C. And so we, we basically kind of came around to the realization that actually the business was much more interesting if it was a B two C kind of company with a consumer brand where you kind of own the consumer and the relationship at 100 percent of the revenue and weren't sharing it with these partners. So you know that, that we were grappling with that strategically for a long time. We sometimes would grapple with this whole question of like, should we take inventory? Um, we were often grappling with the regulatory issues. You know, we had we were operating in a regulated market. Ticket scalping, as it was called, was illegal in many yep. states. And so you know there were a lot of you know sort of navigation um, you know questions along the way. Um, and uh, you know ultimately we I mean, we made some good decisions and some bad ones. We certainly made plenty of mistakes. Yeah. So kind of to transition a little bit into what you're up to now, I know after you sold StubHub, um, you know, years after um, you ended up doing being an investor yourself, angel investing, and then now you're a general partner at Craft Ventures, um, which I think uh, is so it started by David Sachs, right, who also sold his company PayPal to uh, eBay. So you guys both share that uh, common common theme there, um, I'm sure, among other things. So tell us a little bit about um you know, kind of like what you're excited about, what your focus is on, you know, about, you know, what you're excited about seeing in the next few years, I guess, and things that um, maybe you're thinking about now. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, what you said is exactly right. Uh, David Sachs and Bill Lee started the firm in 2017. I joined in 2018. Um, you know, Kraft is, um, you know, a venture capital firm. We're based in, in San Francisco, though we have you know, we have people in LA and New York, um, in the Bay Area, um, and we're investing in, you know, uh, in software companies and company, the companies that are building software products, um, where there are, you know, kind of in-house software development teams, um, with core competency in writing code and building software products. Within that, we are, we are mostly focused on, um, SaaS businesses and marketplace businesses. So we, you know, David, as you pointed out, David was one on the founding team of PayPal. He's also the founder of Yammer. PayPal was sold to eBay. Yammer was sold to Microsoft. Um, and, you know, just really smart um, investor, a successful entrepreneur, and, um, you know, and, you know, just a, just a great, a great guy to be working with. Um, and, uh, he, he spends a lot of his time on SaaS uh, businesses, and I spend a lot of my time on marketplace businesses. But you know, we we sometimes go outside of those. I mean, those aren't defined hard lines. We sometimes go out of those lines, but um, that's kind of where we tend to focus and what the types of businesses we gravitate towards. 
Um, and we, you know, we announced earlier this year that we just raised our third venture fund in, in, in the first half of 2021, but we also raised our first growth fund. So now we're doing kind of, you know, a broader spectrum of, you know, investing when, when you think about stage, we're, we're investing in er- really yeah. early stage, seed, seed stage companies sometimes. And we're also investing in like unicorns that are already, you know, into the billion dollar valuation out of our growth fund. So we are, um, you know, we're, we're, pretty new kids on the block in a way because we've only been around since 2017 um and um you know we're super super excited to be you know partnering with finding and partnering with you know the next generation of of you know unicorn founders what do you think i'm curious your your perspective like what do you think happens in vc in general right like when it comes to the model of venture capital and and obviously we're going through this shift now where there's a lot of like democratization in a lot of ways when it comes to investing in companies. Like, how do you feel about what's happening in VC specifically? And what do you think is going to be like the next wave of innovation when it comes to, you know, certain firms being able to kind of stay ahead uh, versus like falling, falling behind. If that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, I mean, th- there are two things that we, I think that we do a craft to sort of differentiate ourselves and try to, you know, cause, cause you're right. It's a competitive, you know, it's a competitive market. There's a, there, there are certain changes happening, but I think the biggest change is frankly, just that it's becoming more competitive, right? Because what's happening is there's more venture capital funds. There's more money flowing into venture capital, but you also have some of these other funds that historically were not venture capital funds. Maybe they were hedge funds in New York city, or maybe they were, you know, kind of, late stage growth funds that are all kind of coming into vent. They're coming earlier and earlier stage and they're now investing in private companies at fairly early stages. So we're seeing them, you know, competitively in certain deals. And we're also seeing them, you know, invest in some of our portfolio companies, you know, in deals in, in invest in rounds after we invest. And that dynamic is definitely creating more competition. And so I think the key thing is you have to differentiate yourselves. You have to, you have to bring something to the table that is, um, that founders uh, really value, and and it, and really the customer is the founders, right? The, the founders and and the teams that are building these companies is kind of who we serve, and that's you know we're trying to figure out how we can serve them better. Um, and what we what we do at Craft to try to serve them better is really two things. One is we focus only on a limited set of companies, the, the ones I just described, really SaaS businesses and marketplace businesses, and by doing that. Um, you know, we can gain expertise in those business models and we can then bring that value in those and that expertise to these founders to help them make their companies even more successful. And, you know, the reason why it makes sense for us to do SaaS and marketplaces, because David is the founder of a very successful SaaS business in Yammer, and I was the founder of a very successful marketplace in StubHub. So we've built these companies ourselves. And so we can now bring that, you know, expertise from, from being founders, but also, you know, we've also now invested in dozens of these companies. So we have a lot of learnings and pattern matching that we can bring to the table to kind of help these founders. Founders um, be successful in their in their journeys. Yeah, yeah, exactly. To that point, I think it's it's exactly that. Like, kind of uh, honing in on what your particular expertise is, and and the fact that you're a founder and have built a successful company, I think is is a huge thing too. As opposed to being like a career investor or just like a finance person, because you know you know things from the other side of like not just the numbers, but the the qualitative stuff of of being an entrepreneur um, and building a successful business, and then. Yeah, like bringing that expertise and in. instead of kind of, you know, you, you often see, you know, people kind of chasing the, the, the new hot thing on the block when they don't really know much about it. And that's kind of uh, perhaps a recipe for disaster sometimes too. Jeff, I'm sure you get this yeah, a lot, ahead. but I have a SaaS and marketplace business idea that I'm raising $10 million at a $3 billion <laughs> valuation. So if you're interested, you know, we'll talk offline and you know I mean, it's, it's a, it's a combo business, <laughs> SaaS and marketplace. I don't know how it works yet, but we can, we can, we can, we can dive deeper. <laughs> well, so a couple thoughts on that. So there, there is a very, there's a, there's a very, um, well, well-known playbook of, of, of a SaaS enabled marketplace where what you do is you, you give away a SaaS or you don't always give it away. Sometimes you charge for it, but in some cases you actually give away a SaaS utility, a tool mm-hmm that is useful yeah. to um, some set of users. Mm-hmm. And that you, that set of users is one side of the marketplace. Right. Sometimes it's like the supply right. side, sometimes the demand side. So the, the example in Subhub would be like, you give away a SaaS tool for ticket brokers, totally. like a way for them to like do their business, right? right? And it's just like a SaaS utility. Right. Maybe you even give it to them for free. At that point, 
building a marketplace becomes much easier because yep. you already have half yep. the marketplace. So then all you got to do is bring demand to the table. And so that idea of a SaaS enabled marketplace, I think is a, a really strong playbook. And we, we, we see that in, um, you know, in some of our businesses, sometimes they start with a SaaS business and then they add the marketplace. Yep. I've also seen cases where you start with a marketplace and then you can kind of, and then, start building right. SaaS tools for yeah. the two sides I of the marketplace as sort of a second step. I, I totally think it's the future. I think one of the companies that Pat and I had on, uh, or the founder, was the founder of Betterment. And I think that they've done that essentially with providing their platform for financial advisors. Meanwhile, they also have the B2C product technically where, you know, they have consumers like us that are investing their monies on their platform. So I think I've, I've been seeing a lot more of it. Obviously, my comment to you was a joke, but there it's definitely not a joke in the sense that that exists and it's continuing to grow because I do think that marriage of B2B and B2C, you know, and providing two different experiences within the same company, same product is actually where we're going to be headed. So it's really interesting to hear that you guys are doing that. And I, I personally can't wait to follow uh, the companies that you guys are investing in and, you know, uh, see what those are like. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think, the, you know, the, but just going back also, um, you know, to your earlier question, I think the, um, you know, the, the, the two things we do to really differentiate ourselves with Crafter, you know, you kind of brought it up, Patrick, as you were talking um, and sort of summarizing what I was saying, but it's really about the focus and then about the fact that we've been founders. And those two things, I think, allow us to, you know, be different than, than most other firms out there. And, um, and I think bring, you know, bring something to the table that, that resonates with many founders. Yeah, I agree. Well, this has been amazing. I mean, uh, can't thank you enough for you know, taking the time to to join us and, and share your story, but also your wisdom and everything that you've kind of learned along the way and uh, things you're working on now. So as Posh mentioned, we're excited to see what comes next, not just for you, but for craft. And um, yeah, uh, we'll keep in touch. Absolutely. Yeah, no, no, it, uh, no problem. Really enjoyed talking to you guys today. And thanks for having me on. And um, please do keep in touch. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff.